Black Nouveau. This is our edition for March 25th, 2015. I'm Joanne Williams. Prostate cancer is the second most common cause of cancer deaths in the United States. We'll talk with two prostate cancer survivors. We'll also talk with the City Health Department's Men's Health Manager. And we're going to profile Milwaukee's own actor and singer, Jason McKinney. You know, recently we talked about the new Unite Milwaukee Summit. The event brought almost 200 community members together to discuss ways to reduce violence in Milwaukee. Too often, violence hits the youngest members of our community. I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Children are our future but all too often, that future doesn't happen. Just a random thing that happened, you know. The violence in Milwaukee, wow. <laughs> Anthony Barksdale should know. When he was 14, he saw Marcus DeBack, a nine-year-old friend he considered his little brother, get hit in the head by a bullet. Both were innocent bystanders to a playground argument that escalated into gunfire. Right when I thought everything was okay, the bullet hit, you can see the, the bullet hits the fence, splits and hits him. That's from what I hear. I thought the bullet uh, we, we ricocheted, but I, from what we hear, the bullet like split in half and hits him in the back of the head and he falls. And that's the last image I get to, you know, remember, Marcus. It was, you know, devastating moment. He's like, you knew it was bad. You, you, you knew that, you know, it wasn't going to be right from that. You know, there's no coming back from that because you can, you know, you know, you can see the blood, you know, or, or whatever. And, the, you know, it, the swelling started and, you know, it's just like, man, this is, this is one of those images that you'll never, ever, ever, ever forget. An honor roll student at St. Leo's Catholic Academy, Marcus was one of at least nine children that Milwaukee has lost to violence. A year after his death, the playground at Wright and 55th was named after him. The memory of that day still haunts Anthony. Not being able to be faster than a speeding bullet or it kind of like I don't know, it just makes you feel like you just let the world down, you know, because like it's not supposed to happen to him. It's supposed to happen, I guess, I don't know, to other people, but not, not, not the people that you are, are with every day, you know. Yeah. I don't know, you know, it's just, I, I don't know a proper way to feel about that, you know. I'm still working on that one. It's 20 years later, I'm still working on that one. Shortly after Marcus's death, Anthony left Milwaukee. He returned a few years ago and currently teaches special education classes in the Milwaukee public school system. He believes that much of the violence is due to a sense of hopelessness and the lack of education in our community. I think we need to be more involved with the education aspect of it because we have to give them hope because I don't think our youth, they, I don't think they have the hope in the communities as, uh, as we need, you know, because they, they just feel like, um, well, nobody cares. So if I do this, nobody's really going to care about me anyway. So if we're able to give them hope, then I think that it'll be a lot, you'll see a change. If you change the mindset of a people, then you're able to change the outcome of, of situations. You're able to, if you, if, you, if you change the mindset and you give them a direction to go in, which is positive, then naturally it's like a domino effect because generations start to follow that model. And if we're ever introduced that in a good and direct way to them, they'll follow.
State Senator Nakia Harris Dodd, who called the summit, is with us now. Welcome back to Black Nouveau. Thank you. How did first of all, how did this how did the summit go? The summit went exceptionally well. We had uh, approximately um, 125 uh, people that attended, and it was a lot of new faces in the room, which was very inspiring because it's not, it wasn't the same old people that show up for everything. But these were just the folks we wanted to target, and these were lay members, um, members who live in communities that are affected by um, poverty, violence, uh, and, and, you know, joblessness. And so it was really good to have those individuals in the room to want to um, solve the problems of violence. What age range attended? Old, young, or mostly younger people? We had an intergenerational group um, where we saw old, uh, individ older individuals, we saw younger individuals, we saw, you know, just in the middle um, of that at that age range. Uh, and we had a very diverse group of people, too. So you didn't see, you know, just one s s uh, sector of our community, but you saw a wide range of individuals um, show up. The video that we just saw uh, featured Anthony Barksdale, who was a close friend of yeah. Marcus DeBack, who was shot on the playground several years ago. Yeah. He was talking about one way to try and curb violence mm -hmm. is to bring hope to young people. Did mm -hmm. you discuss that at the summit? Oh, we had a great um, uh, introduction, actually, uh, that was a presentation by uh, both Muhib Dyer and Antoine, uh, Kwabana Antoine Nixon, um, who actually uh, invited the young folks to get engaged, which was really compelling, and it um, really energized the young people, I think, where they really inspired them uh, and had them chant um, a, sa a statement that they use in Milwaukee Public Schools when they're working with the young men and women, is, I will not die young. And so it was really a good opportunity to see those young people uh, lock arms and chant uh, this, this, this statement, um, and, and really, it, it, I think it inspired hope in those young people. And what I really loved about it is that the young people came up without a fuss. Uh, they walked up proudly with their heads held high, shoulders back, and really just got involved in what, what the day was about. So it's really this, good. Th this is the first time you've held this summit? Yes. Was it a success? I would call it a success. I think we achieved the goals we wanted to achieve. One, number one was getting different people in a room, neighbors who live in communities that were affected and is affected by violence and, and are tired and really want to do something about it. And something as simple as speaking to your neighbors on the right and the left of you, and then taking it a step further and really bringing some action uh, to that hello <laughs> and, and start a um, block watch, uh, work with your your police captains in your district to bring a sense of pride to the neighborhood and really engage neighbors. Were members of the police department there? Yes, we had uh, both chap uh, excuse me, ch captains from District 3 as well as District 7 who spoke on a panel with uh, community members who were black excuse me, a neighborhood association uh, presidents in their area. And so they worked with those particular uh, captains and work with those departments to really bring, again, a, that sense of presence and hope um, and, and just that community feel back to the neighborhood. So it sounds like you had a very good day. Yes. An inspiring summit. Yes. People went away feeling energized. Yes. Now what? What happens next? So the next steps, uh, we're gonna, we had a working lunch where the young people as well as uh, other neighbors that were in the room were able to give feedback on what they, what they felt were best, uh, a, be a good direction to go into to um, de deter violence in the neighborhoods and in their communities and what they can do as leaders um, to deter violence. And so we're gonna take um, everything that happened that day from the three panels that we had uh, to the working lunch Lunch that we had where we had tables working together and we challenged them to uh, not sit with the person they came with um, and really have a hardcore discussion about, you know, what are the next steps for them as they go back into their communities. And so we're going to compile all that information and create a report that will be public to share with that those community members as well as um, whoever else is interested in that how, information. How long is it going to be before we see this report? 
Uh, it should be uh, hopefully within the next three weeks. We want to get it out as soon as possible, but trying to compile all that information is going to take a little time, but we certainly are working diligently and quick enough so that we can get it back. Now, mind you, this is also a summit that I would like to do annually because I think that this conversation can grow and, and turn into what I would like to see, a blueprint where every member of our community is held accountable from the, the, the young person that live in that neighborhood to our elected officials, including myself. So it's accountability with all of this. Well, we'll see if that occurs, and we'll certainly look forward to seeing you again next year. Thanks for talking today. Thank you. Opera singer Jason McKinney is a native Milwaukeean who knew as a young man he would make his living in music. Good morning. Morning, Liddy. What was it like coming back home to Milwaukee? You know, it's great to come back to my old stomping grounds, to see some old friends, old teachers, um, go to my old school, and, you know, spend time with family and just enjoy, you know, the great city that is Milwaukee. How has Milwaukee changed since your youth? Well, a lot of it has stayed the same, but a lot of it seems to be a little less diverse. You know, there seems to be a little bit more division between um, neighborhoods and classes and people. And um, I, I just noted that, noticed that a little bit more. Um, it's not something that I like to mention, but it's definitely true. I see a little bit more of um, a little bit more of a segregated city than, than I seemed to notice when I was a child. And he's very uh, sensitive to those kinds of issues, being that he's black and Jewish. What was it like growing up in that kind of? Well, um, a year not a year went by when someone didn't ask me, "How are you, black and Jewish?" And my response. I'm fine. How are you, black and Jewish? Which is a nice little joke. Um, you know, it had, sometimes it was hard. You know, people did not believe that I was a Jew or they believed I converted to Judaism, uh, which is not the case. I was born and raised Jewish. I don't know if you can see it. 100% both, 100% proud. Uh, you know, so uh, sometimes people don't want to accept and you just have to let them deal with it. Uh, you know, I'm not going to change who I am, and um, it's, it's been exciting for my career because I have a little bit of a niche that I can, um, that I can utilize. Um, I can, you know, sing a recital of all Jewish music or all African-American spirituals or combine them both or you know, use my own uh, musical ability of composition to to give uh, black and Jewish voice to music, which has been a lot of fun, and I've enjoyed that a lot. Here am I before thee, with a grave and a play for this my people. What hast thou done to this for thy people? Why is thou so oppressed, this thy people? Where the sorrow, surely the sons of the oppressed, who ever suffered... He started performing or getting gigs while in college. Um, I had a few gigs that just put a little more extra change in my pocket, and um, it was just a lot of fun going to school, taking gigs on the side. Uh, then I began to focus more on the gigs than I did on the school and thus uh, it took me a long time to graduate. But I was still gigging that entire time because whenever the start of the semester would come about, I would always have a really high profile or high paying gig that I really wanted to take. So um, it took some focus and some determination uh, for me to finish my degree, but I finally did. Well, it has been a way for me to make a living. He's performed in numerous productions, Porky and Bess, which he returned home for. Opera Memphis in Memphis, Tennessee. Macbeth with Greg Baker and Marquita Lister, directed by Larry Marshall. And it was because of that show that I actually got started with Porgy and Bess. Because Larry Marshall, who was a very famous sport in life, um, and I was a wonderful director, 
informed me that he directs that show every summer in Europe. And I said, well, Larry, you should hire me. I was just sitting there in the corner reading Porgy because I had never read the novel. I was reading the novel and Larry came up to me and said, you should do it. I said, have him give me a call. About three months later, I got a phone call. I had just finished a gig and um, they said, uh, Mr. McKinney, can you come to Amsterdam for two weeks and, and join this tour? And I said, sure. And then I thought, geez, I hope I could find my passport. But I found it. And I was able to join the tour. We went to Amsterdam and Antwerp and Hamburg and Zurich, Baden-Baden, Bremen, Cologne, Berlin, um, Leipzig. Jason McKinney has been diversifying into more acting. He's now doing a one-man play called Paul Robeson. I also have been putting more Jewish music and I've been putting more Jewish music on my recitals so that I can go ahead and just share with people my experiences as a black Jew and get them to incorporate um, some of that music into, into their repertoire of listening. Um, I also do some of my own music. I compose a little bit and so some of the Jewish music that I, I like to put on the recital is pretty well received. I would say for any young person who believes that they have the ability to sing, I would say to them to make sure that singing is the only thing in your life that's really going to make you happy. If that's what's going to make you happy, go for it. If you can envision yourself doing anything else, you should do something else. Prostate cancer is one of the most common that men develop. It's especially deadly among African-American men. Everett Marshburn has more. Men have a problem with doctors inserting their fingers up into the rectum for, for whatever the reason may be. Men, I mean, I'm, I'm not no freak, but if, it come, if, it's, it's, if it's life over death, you know, examine me the way you got to examine me and stuff. At the age of 40, Hudson Avery Jr. had his first prostate exam. That was in 1994, and he discovered that he had an enlarged prostate. From 19, basically, um, I say 1994 until now, I, I had no real big problem with my prostate. And um, then in, in like June, July of 2014, I noticed that I was having to use the restroom more frequently. That led to tests blood work, and a biopsy. And they did a biopsy, took 12 SNPs, as they call it, and out of the 12, seven out of 12 was found to be cancerous. How'd that make you feel? <laughs> I, I felt so scared. I felt so scared because the, the C word, the cancer, is like an automatic death sentence. But the good thing they said to me was that uh, it, it was treatable. You know, I wasn't, they didn't, it, there was not a six month limit on my life and stuff, you know. And they said to me, and you know, they said, in fact, Mr. Avery, if you ever had to have cancer, if you ever had to volunteer for cancer, prostate cancer is the line that you would want to get into. They told me, they said, well, Mr. Avery, you can, you can have hormone shots, you know, or you can have chemo you know, certain forms of other forms of radiation, or you can have the surgery. I had the surgery January the 30th, and uh, they initially told me it was gonna be a overnight stay, but I ended up staying in the hospital till like about the 4th or the 5th of, of uh, February. I went in on, on a Friday, and I came home on a Thursday. Spencer Coggs was the treasurer for the city of Milwaukee. In 2006, he was in the Wisconsin State Senate when he was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I actually felt like my body had betrayed me because I'd never been to the hospital before. I'd never had 
uh, major surgery and never really had any problems with anything. And yet here I am now, uh, in my late 50s, with prostate cancer. So um, I thought about my family history, and my family history wasn't great in terms of you know, hypertension uh, and other maladies that black males oftentimes have. So made a very quick decision uh, to everybody's relief to go ahead and have the surgery. Most men are afraid of a prostate cancer diagnosis because first they think about the old days when you had surgery and many times men came back impotent or in uh, incontinent. Okay, and so I, I had those same concerns like every other male. But in talking to the doctors, the surgeries have changed in all these years, okay? And my doctor was going to give me what they call nerve sparing surgery, which means after the surgery, everything still works, okay? Now, when you tell a person like me that, then I'm, I'm all for it, okay? And he had done thousands of surgeries over the years, so I had confidence in him. The surgery was successful and Cogs fully recovered with no after effects. I went through the process of monthly checkups, uh, three month checkups, six month checkups. Now I'm at a year to year checkup and I'm proud to say that I went this year and my diagnosis is completely fine. And ever since my surgery, they've been fine and they've been consistent. I gotta tell you, I became a hero in my family. Uh, my daughter uh, flew in from Boston to see me and she was just overjoyed and to see the look on her face because I lost my parents at an early age, okay? Uh, and I didn't want to see that happen to anybody else in my family. And to this day, my daughter still thanks me. Daryl Davidson is the men's health manager for the city of Milwaukee Health Department. Welcome back to Black Nouveau. Thank you for having me. You have something relatively new, the Men's Health Centers, right? Yes, the Men's Health Centers are through the City of Milwaukee Health Department. We have three of them now. And they are? They are the Northwest Health Center, 7630 West Mill Road. We also have one at the Keenan Health Center, 36 and uh, Wright Street. And we also have another one at the Southside Health Center near 23rd and Mitchell. And that one just opened? Yes. Now, we just saw some conversation about prostate cancer diagnosis, treatment, reactions to. Uh, is that one of the things you try and emphasize when men come to your centers? It's an important educational topic. We know that there's a lot of information that contradicts, but we want people to have fact-based knowledge. And so anyone who comes in, if they are above 40 years old, at the very least, we're going to introduce them to some information, find out if it's relative to them and relevant. We also want to make sure that they have a relationship with a doctor or a health care provider. If they don't, we can help them navigate through and find places. How many men come in for the first time seeing a doctor and they're over 40 years old? Oh, it's almost too many to count, unfortunately. And what we're seeing, the average age of men not seeing a doctor is right after high school. There's a period when they don't see anyone until symptoms, and then maybe they might show up for a sexually transmitted infection. After that, they don't see anyone for years. And then finally, when it looks like there's something very serious going on, they'll show up again. Why? What keeps men away from doctors? It seems like many of them are showing up when there's pain associated. And what we tell them is, if there's pain, then that's telling you that there's something going on. Most of the time, if there's a serious problem, it's been developing for years. So here's an example. If someone has any condition that has been going on for years, by the time it gets diagnosed, you're going to have some type of organ failure or something even uh, more serious. I had a friend who never went to the doctor, didn't want to go to the doctor, didn't get his colonoscopy, didn't get all of his tests. And when he finally was diagnosed with colon cancer, he died like six months later. How common is that? It's more common than what gets announced. You know, it's interesting. Men have um, a lower life expectancy than women. Women throughout their lifespan, they go from seeing pediatricians and um, gynecologists, and it's a regular part of what they consider to be a relationship with their health care provider. Men, it's really not the same thing. And so we hear story after story after story with celebrities and 
other people who you might even know in a personal situation that have a similar outcome. When, when men come to your centers, will they be screened for prostate cancer? No, we're not the screening um, um, clinic. We're the ones who are going to do the prevention education. We talk to them about things that are relevant. So it's going to be nutrition and physical activity, um, what's going on with their diet, when was the last time they saw their doctor, things that also might um, cause stress in their life. But ultimately, we have a network of partners. We call it our Men's Health Referral Network. And we introduce them to our partners. And that includes the federally qualified health centers, as well as some of the larger healthcare organizations in the city. And that's where you're going to have that um, screening take place. And I was going to say, how can you convince men to take better care of themselves? What's the secret to that? Well, first, we have to be as honest as possible. And most of the time, men are going to show up if someone else tells them to show up. And who is that someone else, usually? Often it's a woman in their life, sister, a mother. But it's going to be someone who is not the man showing up for the Men's Health Center. It's going to be someone else making the appointment sometimes. Just so they keep those appointments. That's the important That's part. That's the important part, yes. If, if people want to know more, is there a way to contact the Men's Health Center? Please call 414-286-6529 and someone will be able to help you and get you to one of our centers. Um, we do serve walk-ins, but if you call the number, you can find out what our hours are. They vary, and we do have evening hours also. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for talking with us today, Daryl Davidson from the Milwaukee Health Department, talking about the Men's Health Center. Thank you. Before we close tonight, two programming notes. Next Monday, March 30th, here on Channel 10, the show I Remember talks with Milwaukee civil rights activist John Givens. Also that evening, Channel 10 begins a three-part series by Ken Burns called Cancer, the Emperor of All Maladies. We hope you tune in. And that's our program for this week. For Black Nouveau, I'm Joanne Williams. Thanks for joining us. The cancer segment of this program was funded by the generosity of these underwriters. 